All right, everyone, good evening. We are going to get started. How many of you counted the fish? And if you want to practice using the chat box, you can write a number in the chat box. I didn't count the fish, so I don't know how many they are. <laughs> there are. Just wanted something for you guys to do while you're waiting. So sorry about that. No right answer on the fish counting. So today we are talking about fish food and we're gonna spend approximately the next 30 minutes to 45 minutes um, on this webinar. My name is Julie Watson. I'm our wildlife education coordinator here for the Nevada Department of Wildlife and our panelist and moderator, she will be helping me out with the chat and all of that. Her name is Abby Zarnecki and she's our Southern Region Angler Education Coordinator. And um, she uh, is down in the Las Vegas area and she is an angling expert. Um, so we're gonna be talking today about tiny aquatic critters. So this is not really a fish program, it's about what fish eat. And I like to use this as an excuse to talk about bugs for 30 minutes because I'm a big bug fan. So um, this is a program about bugs. And we're gonna talk about their life cycles, where they fit in the food chain, and how these bugs can affect our lives and why we should care about them. So it is important because Nevada is, it's such a dry area. We don't have a lot of aquatic ecosystems to begin with. So our aquatic ecosystems are incredibly important and the balance in these ecosystems is kept because of these little critters that we're gonna be talking about today. So before we get started, I wanna let everyone know that you are muted. I can't see you, I can't hear you. So you can hang out in your, in your home as comfortable as you want. So, you know, pants are totally optional with our webinars. Can't see you, can't hear you. Um, this is a family program. So we wanna keep everything rated PG. There's a couple ways that we'll be able to interact. Um, I'll be putting up some polls that will be, you'll, that will be self-explanatory. You'll see how to do that. You can also use our chat box. And so when you use the chat box, there's a little box at the top with an arrow. And you want to make sure that when you type something, something in the chat box, that it says that it goes to all attendees and panelists so that we can all see what you're saying or if you're asking a question. And that's how you'll be able to ask questions. You can also raise your hand. There's a little button where you can raise your hand. I do not suggest doing that. It will not do anything but make me very annoyed. <laughs> um, so type anything in the chat box. And if I miss anything, if there's too much going on in the chat box, Abby is there to help out. Um, and we want to make sure that while you're using the chat box, we stay on topic. So asking questions, um, if I ask a question to you, that's where you will respond in the chat box. And Abby will be watching that. So please, um, please keep it PG. This is a fun family program. And so we're going to go ahead and get started and talk about some little critters. So I've got two pictures here of some water. And so... I've got a beautiful river on one side and a cup of drinking water on the other side. And so when you see these pictures, I want you guys to go ahead and use the chat box and let me know what you think about of what's in your water. Laura says minerals, so you're going on the drinking water side. Cherry says bacteria, so that's kind of on the other side too. Fluoride, yeah, <laughs> if it's coming out of our sinks. Chlorine, fluoride, alkaline, calcium, yeah. So you guys are all kind of thinking about the one side. Yeah, now we've got some other thinking about the more natural side. Small crustaceans and bugs in our water. sediment. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff in our water. And I asked this question because we ha really do have two different sides to our water. We have the drinking water side and the side that comes out of our sinks. And then we have 
the natural side. And a lot of people don't make the connection that our natural side of our water, our rivers, our streams, our lakes, our ponds, that is all, that's where the water that comes out of our drinking fountains and what we drink and what we use for all those other reasons every single day, that they're the same. It's the same water. So yeah, bugs, bacteria, fluoride, all of that. All of that is in our water. So let's zoom in. Let's zoom into our water. This is water from a pond and a freshwater pond. If this were salt water, it would look totally different, but you can see there are little pieces of dirt. This is kind of dirty water. There's some living tiny little things in here, possibly some bacteria. So now we're going to take one step out and look at our water. So we're still looking at some fresh water. We've got a bunch of little tiny bugs here. Does anyone know what kind of bugs these are? Anyone want to shout it out in the chat? Someone guessed mayfly larva. That is a good guess, but these are actually mosquitoes. <laughs> these are mosquito larva. So let's zoom out a little bit more. We've got our fish. Yeah, oh, Steve knows, Steve knows mosquitoes. We've got fish. So as we're zooming out from what's inside our water, we can zoom all the way out and we've got our full ecosystem. And this is where external factors are interacting with that water, like us, mammals, birds. So for our talk today, we are gonna stay at this level. We're looking at the little tiny organisms that live in our water. And these little things that we're talking about today are macroinvertebrates. Now, Abby and I were talking about this before, that macroinvertebrates is this really, really long word. It can be a little scary. It's kind of jargony. Um, so I want to break the word down because it's about something a lot more simple than what this word sounds like. So breaking it down, the word macro is the opposite of micro, so it's pretty big. It's large enough to see with the naked eye. And that in this this instance, that is what that word means. So when we were looking back and all the way zoomed into that water and we were looking at the little pieces of dirt and those very, very tiny organisms, you would need a microscope to see that. But when we zoomed out a little bit and we could see the mosquito larva, that's the level that we're gonna be at. You can see mosquito larva with no assistance. You can see it with your naked eye, without a microscope, without any sort of lens, unless you have really, really bad vision, but if you have normal vision or if you have glasses and you have corrective lenses, you should be able to see without any other help this level. Now invertebrates. So I can give you a hint. We're vertebrates. We have backbones. So the opposite of that are invertebrates. Those are animals that don't have backbones. And so the definition is that it doesn't have a backbone. That's our definition. So if we put it together, macroinvertebrates are tiny animals with no backbone that you don't need a microscope to see. So when we break that down, they're basically tiny water bugs. Invertebrates are bugs, crustaceans, and all sorts of other animals. And we're talking specifically about aquatic macroinvertebrates today. There are other macroinvertebrates that live on land. You probably get them in your house, like ants and spiders and those things. Um, but we're specifically talking about aquatic macroinvertebrates and freshwater, because we're in Nevada. We don't have um, saltwater. So we're gonna be focusing on these four species and um, these are kind of these are these are common in our freshwater ecosystems too. And so we've got a dragonfly here, a mayfly, a caddisfly, and a stonefly. And I'm sure that those names sound a little familiar to you. And these are those in some animals we might be more familiar with the terrestrial or flying version of these animals, like a dragonfly. So um, we're gonna get a little bit more into the life cycle in just a bit, but I do want to make a point that I would love to sit here and talk about every single macroinvertebrate that you could encounter in Nevada waters, 
but we don't have time. So I do want to say other things that you could find in water that are considered aquatic macroinvertebrates and are also equally as important as some of the ones that we're going to talk about today, but leeches, snails, freshwater clams, crawfish. We don't have any native crawfish in Nevada, um, but we do have crawfish. They're just not from here. Um, there's also freshwater jellyfish, and I don't know if we can find those in Nevada, but I do know you can find them in Colorado. It's very, very rare though. That would be so crazy to stumble upon a freshwater jellyfish. Uh, beetles, spiders, mosquitoes, worms, those are all macroinvertebrates. So you probably noticed as I was listing all of those off, not all of them fall under insects. There's also crustaceans and um, uh, arachnids and then the worms and those other types of animals that aren't considered insects. So macroinvertebrates really encompasses a lot of different types of little animals. But we're going to focus on these top four. And so I know a lot of people in here are probably fishermen, so uh, can't talk about macroinvertebrates without bringing up that we are really good at mimicking nature as humans. So we're talking about fish food. These macroinvertebrates are some of our favorite fish's favorite food. So we've gotten really good at coming up with ways to attract fish by using what they naturally eat. So we've got a dragonfly here with, this is a dragonfly nymph and it's got a dragonfly nymph tie or fly. So you can see that we've mimicked it pretty well. I've got a mayfly here, a mayfly nymph with its look-alike fly and a stonefly nymph with its look-alike fly and a caddisfly larva with its look-alike. So you can see how we're mimicking nature in a lot of these. So I want to put a poll out before I move on. How many in this group fly fish? So the options are, yep, all the time, I have once or twice, or never. And it looks like we've got the majority of people that are here today that have, um, that have fished once or twice. So that's cool. I'll share the results with you. We've got a couple that have all the time and a couple that have never. That's great. So let's look at the life cycle. Um, we were talking about that a little bit earlier about what that life cycle is like. So when I showed you them earlier, these are all the babies. Basically, all of those in those pictures that are tiny, those are the baby slash teenager version of these bugs. And these are insects. Some of these insects go through incomplete metamorphosis, and there is one that I showed you, and you might have noticed the language that I used, um, that goes through complete metamorphosis. So I'm going to talk about the three, uh, the three individuals that I showed you that are that go through incomplete metamorphosis. They are insects, so they go through a really cool change. They have neat, um, pretty neat life cycles. So. Just like any other animal, their life cycle begins with mating, then they lay eggs, which these eggs get laid in water, and they go into the nymph, which this is spelled with an M. It should be an N. It's a nymph with an N. Um, then they go into their nymph stage, and then they molt and emerge into an adult. And so they only really have two life stages. They hatch their nymph, and then they emerge into an adult. And just like the nymphs that I showed you for flies, we can also make the adults into flies. So you can see we've got an adult dragonfly here and the corresponding fly right here, an adult mayfly and the corresponding um, fly right here, and the stonefly and the corresponding fly right here. So we make flies for all stages of the life cycle because fish are eating these insects at all stages of their life cycle. 
And um, as we go on, so this is a, uh, uh, oh, okay. So someone's asking, how do these bugs transform from breathing in water to breathing in air? So I'm gonna go back so that I can show you what, oh, I'm going forward. That's a good question before we move on. You can kind of see it in this picture. So when these insects are in the water, they actually have gills. So they suction water and process the oxygen out of the water with gills. So this, these little weird things coming up, those are gills. So ki kind of like a fish, I'm sure it works a little differently. But then when they emerge into adults, that's when they function, they have spiracles, just like any other insect where they get air through, through holes in their exoskeletons, just like any other insect. That's a good question. So they, between this stage, when they start to molt and they emerge to become an adult, this is a crazy process because even though they're going through incomplete metamorphosis, a immature dragonfly or mayfly or stonefly doesn't look anything like its adult counterparts for the most part. So uh, one of my friends captured this and I wanted to share with you a, the, these really awesome pictures of a dragonfly emerging from its molt, its last molt right before it becomes an adult. So you can see this is the nymph shell and it's just starting to pull its adult body out of that shell. There's from the top. And these little stubs right here are its wings. And so kind of like when a butterfly emerges, those wings haven't been filled out yet. And you'll kind of see in this progression how those wings get filled up. You can see it's got some of its abdomen out, but it's really, really thick. There's those wings. I think that looks so cool. The wings are starting to puff up a little bit more. And I didn't look this up, but I believe it is very similar to a butterfly. When a butterfly emerges, their abdomen is really big and they're pumping fluid from their abdomen into their wings. And so those wings have those veins. So they're pumping fluid through their little veins from their abdomen to their wings to pump up their wings. And you can see it's getting, getting bigger. Its wings are even bigger. Abdomen is still a little swollen, not quite ready for takeoff yet. And then I think this is the last one. This is pretty much, it's ready to go, this dragonfly. And you can see it has like the very normal um, diameter abdomen. It's, it's a fully emerged, a fully adult dragonfly. And this is that leftover shell. And I found a couple of these before and it's really cool. It's just like if you find cicada shells, except it's a dragonfly. It has, a, you know, to me, it looks like something alien, you know, it like, it, it like emerged out of some skin, so, which it did, but it's, it just, it's just so crazy that this is something that we share the earth with. It's not an alien, it's just an insect. So the caddisfly goes through a, a little bit different life cycle, and you probably heard me refer to the caddisfly as a larva instead of a nymph, because it does go through complete metamorphosis. And uh, the, there's one level. So they go from eggs to larva instead of nymph. And then they have a pupa stage. And a pupa stage is exactly like a butterfly's chrysalis. It's the exact same. Butterflies go through complete metamorphosis. Caddisflies also go through complete metamorphosis. And so instead of um, having a chrysalis like a butterfly, which is a butterfly's pupa stage, it has this pupa stage where it's just kind of dormant and then it emerges out of that shell similar to the dragonfly except that the dragonfly nymph was totally mobile and a living thing 
before it emerged, whereas a pupa is a living thing, but it's not mobile. It's just, you know, it's just like a little chrysalis just kind of sitting there doing, doing its thing, getting ready to become an adult. And just like our other flies, we can mimic these. So this is an adult uh, caddis fly, and that's the fly. And then we've got the adult, or the not the adult, the caddis fly pupa, which they are really weird looking. And you can see, so the pupa actually come in a couple different colors, and I'm sure it depends on the species. And so the pupa flies are made with a couple different colors too. So you can see this pupa has a little bit of green to it. So to mimic that, the fly is mimicking, is a little green too. So we've seen what they look like. We've seen what their life, life cycle is like. Where can we find them? So looking at this picture, um, there are a couple places where you could find these little critters right here with these rocks, like really anywhere along this shoreline is probably a good place to look, going in and picking up the rocks and looking at it, looking if there's any, any of them clinging onto the rocks or down at the bottom. Or if you had a net, you could put the net down, uh, down river from the rock, lift the rock up and see if there's any other stuff that kind of detaches and goes in. Um, so that's one good place to find them in a stream. Um, these, in, so uh, someone asked that question about how they transfer from water to breathing air because they have to, so they are an oxygen animal. They use oxygen. And so riffles, this is a very uh, extreme example of riffles, but these areas of water are going to have more oxygen in them because they're getting all um, shaken up. And so there's more dissolved oxygen in that area. And so these bugs need dissolved oxygen. So these riffle areas are a great place to find macroinvertebrates to find these little critters. Um, but if you do go out looking for these little critters um, and you decide to lift up rocks, just make sure that you're putting them right back where they went and you're not crushing any of our new friends that you've discovered in the water. So speaking about that, the four species that I brought up are very particular to moving water. And that's something that's interesting when talking about aquatic macroinvertebrates because moving water and standing water don't work the same. So you won't find the same species in both. There's different species. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. Living in moving water is, is it's difficult. You, they, there's some very specific adaptations that are needed to survive. And so the animals are little critters that live in moving water and streams and rivers. They're clingers and they have a low profile and they're able to cling on to rocks so that they're not just constantly being swept away by the current. And that's why you'll find them on or around rocks because they're clinging. Um, Standing water, on the other hand, so a pond like this is going to have very different species. And um, uh, standing water is usually has a lower water quality because there's not going to be as much dissolved oxygen in a uh, in a pond with standing water, in an area with standing water. So some of our insects that have a lower tolerance for water quality can survive in ponds, whereas some of our insects with a higher tolerance, I'm sorry, a higher tolerance uh, for pollution are going to be able to survive in our pond and our standing water. And we're going to talk a little bit more about tolerances at the very end of this. Um, but most of the four species that we're talking about are found in moving water. The dragonfly, I have found in both and, um, but probably more often in standing water. So dragonflies are, are more well adapted to that standing water. And to show you, we're gonna go back. So this is our mayfly. You can just tell it's low profile. It's clinging to that rock. All of its legs are spread out. It's spreading out um, its whole body so that it can maximize how much of it is touching that rock so that it can cling to it and not get swept away by current. These are our, our friends, the mosquito larva again. And you can just tell by looking, this is not an insect that is well adapted to moving water. 
They are definitely a stagnant standing water species because they have their tail ends here, which is actually where they get their oxygen. They have to have like a little, um, a little straw sticking out of the water, um, kind of snort a little snorkel to get their oxygen. And you can tell just by looking, this would not be a good species to be in moving water. They would just be swept away all the time. And that's why uh, having standing water like a pool or I know when I was little, it was a tire. We had like a tire in our yard and it would fill with water and there would be mosquitoes around that tire all the time. And it was a chore to be like, someone go out there and tip the water out of the tire so that we can get rid of those mosquitoes. Um, so you can really tell that our moving water is gonna have the more clinging like insects and the standing water is not. Um, other examples of some common animals that you would find in standing water, leeches. Leeches are a big fan of standing water. They also really like dark water. Oftentimes people find leeches like around their docks and it's because they really like that dark water. Um, and then beetles, diving beetles, and you can kind of compare a beetle to like a box turtle because they have that round top, some beetles at least, and our clinging animals that are in the running water, they're much more flat, so they're more adapted to that. So that's where we can find some of these critters. Let's talk about the food chain. So you can see in this food chain here, we've got at the very bottom, we've got algae and detritus, which are things that our macroinvertebrates feed on. And they are making up this whole middle part of this food chain. And you can see that our caddisflies eat other macroinvertebrates and, and um, the stonefly eats other macroinvertebrates. This doesn't have dragonflies in it, um, but dragonflies are huge predators in the aquatic world. They are, I've seen pictures of them eating tadpoles. Um, they're able to eat really big things. Um, so having these macroinvertebrates at that very base of the food chain, you can see that smaller fish eat the macroinvertebrates and then some of our favorite fish like trout eat those other fish and they eat the macroinvertebrates directly. So macroinvertebrates, they form a huge part of this food chain. And we're gonna talk about how important that is. So why do we care? Besides the people in here that enjoy fishing, or maybe they want to be more involved in fishing, why should we care about these little tiny critters in our water that we hope probably never end up in a cup of water that we'll be drinking? I wouldn't want to drink those. Um, but why should we care? So the first thing is, is that these are indicator species. And indicator species is a is a word, it's a term that's used in ecology to describe a species or an organism whose presence, absence, or abundance reflects a specific environmental condition. So a, an indicator species can signal a change in the biological condition of an ecosystem and then can be used to diagnose the health of an ecosystem. And so we're looking at these species, they're an indicator species, they're an indicator of healthy freshwater ecosystems. And I know we love fish and we love all of the other creatures that are associated with freshwater, but we are also associated with freshwater. So these are teeny tiny little bugs that really do and can have a big impact on our health and wellness because we all need fresh water. So I was talking about tolerance earlier. So the four species that I've shared with you are not very tolerant. And when I'm talking about tolerance, I'm talking about tolerant to pollution level or just general water quality. And so when we talk about water quality, Pollution is one thing, but pollution leads to low water quality, and that's low dissolved oxygen, um, high nutrient levels, which sounds good, but it's not. Um, 
uh, different chemicals in your water, those types of things, um, how much, how clear your water is, whether your water is carrying lots of sediment or not. Um, and pollution is an interesting thing because pollution isn't always something foreign coming into a system. So when we're talking about water clarity, your water could be polluted by the sediments that are already in the water because they got stirred up. And so pollution isn't always something um, foreign coming into the system. It can be too much of something already in that system like dirt. Having too much dirt in your water system can reduce your water quality. So the four species that we've talked about today, the mayfly, stonefly, caddisfly, and dragonfly, they are in that upper end, which is why they are indicator species. They are very intolerant of pollution. So they have that low tolerance, and it says that dragonfly is more likely going to be in a pond, like I said earlier. Um, some of our more tolerant species that we have on this end, freshwater shrimp, um, this hog louse is an aquatic, um, an aquatic crustacean, worms, and then of course if there is nothing living in your water, it's probably very polluted. Nothing can live there. Um, some other species like uh, leeches are not a good sign of, well, they're not a bad sign, but they are very, they're very tolerant of pollution. So um, find a lot of leeches in your water, probably don't have very very clean water. Um, so if we're talking about different scenarios, let's say you stumbled upon a body of water and you decided to collect all the living things, the little tiny living things from that body of water, and you found mostly worms and these little crustaceans, maybe a couple leeches. What, in the chat you can let me know, what inference would you make about this water? What would you think about that water? Is it going to be very polluted? or do you think it's going to be a pretty healthy water, water system? It's highly polluted. That was one person's guess. Yep, we've got some more pretty polluted, dirty water. And yes, you guys are all correct. If you are only finding these types of critters in your water, it's probably not doing so hot. That's a pretty polluted water system. On the other hand, if we found a body of water that had equal parts, worms and leeches and all of that, and some of our mayflies, dragonflies, caddisflies. What would you guys think about that water? What type of, um, would you guess that that is more polluted or less polluted? Go ahead and let me know in the chat what you think. Yeah, so you guys are right in the chat. You said healthy water, that it's cleaner, it is pretty clean, good water. And yes, you guys are correct. So it, whoop, too far. It doesn't really matter how many, uh, how many animals that you're finding in water that are on that end of the spectrum. If you have a decent abundance and diversity of these species, of those low tolerance species, because they are the indicator. They are that indicator species. So I know lots of people when they find leeches in their water, they like to freak out. But if you have leeches and you have mayflies and stoneflies and dobsonflies and caddisflies and all of those in there, you still have healthy water. It's just leeches can tolerate anything. So that is where an indicator species comes into play. So how does this affect our real life? So using tolerances and our macroinvertebrate indicator species is important in our everyday life. Our water authorities, they use macroinvertebrate samplings to test our waters and make sure that what we're putting back into our water, like our treated sewage 
and things like that aren't polluting it too much. They use those uh, macroinvertebrate sampling techniques as one way to measure this. They also measure dissolved oxygen and nutrients and chemicals and, and other things like that, but that's the abiotic non-living side. Checking the little macroinvertebrates in our water, that's the biotic or the living side, and also can tell us a lot about our water. And obviously we are all humans that need fresh water. So it's really important too, because we happen to drink that water. And I'm sure we all enjoy some fresh water for drinking and, and all the things that we need it for. And you can see in this picture, these are some common um, collect, collection techniques. There's a net here. And so he, that person is in the water, probably kicking up some little things from the bottom and using that net to scoop them in. And then there's this collector too um, that is uh, used to get some of those macroinvertebrates up off the bottom and off those rocks too. Um, so those are some of the real life applications to knowing your macroinvertebrates and how that affects our real life. So before we wrap up, and I'll answer some questions at the very end here, let's take one last look at this food chain. Um, what do you think would happen if our waters could no longer support macroinvertebrates? So if we just completely X'd these out. And you can go ahead and let me know in the chat what you think would happen. No fish food, the fish would die out. No food, fish would die. And we can think even bigger than that. I know that you probably know what other things that aren't in this. Uh, oh, a good, a good answer. There would be too much algae. That's right. Um, but I know that you know there's other things that also eat the fish. So if there's no macroinvertebrates, there's too much algae, the fish can't survive. Other things eat those fish like raptors and bears and people and other animals, raccoons. So you can see how something so tiny can have this huge catastrophic effect on our food chain. And obviously it's really, really important because here in Nevada, it's so dry. Our aquatic ecosystems are so incredibly important. And the balance of these ecosystems, as you can see, really hangs on these macroinvertebrates, these tiny little water critters. So before I let you go, I'll answer some questions um, in the chat, uh, just in case I don't get to your question or you have other questions or you wake up tomorrow morning and you're like, oh my gosh, I have this other great question. You can go ahead and email me. I've got my email here. And we do encourage people when recreating outside to practice responsible recreation. It's a new kit campaign on how to keep yourself and others safe during these COVID times while you're out recreating. Um, there is a website here where you can go on and um, you can make sign a pledge. This is a national campaign to be outside and responsible and um, be responsible while, you, while we're recreating. So if you guys have questions, I'll go ahead and take that time now and um, answer those. So someone asked, do mosquitoes tolerate dirty water? Yes, they do. They're a pretty high tolerant species. Mosquitoes can tolerate dirty water. They can also, uh, their larva can go dormant. So that's why they're able to like, they can survive in a body of water that will completely disappear. You can, that's how you see mosquitoes coming out of puddles. They're, they're pretty, uh, not to toot the mosquito's horn, but uh, <laughs> mosquitoes are pretty well adapted to be able to survive in very little water. Oh, good question. What can we do to improve water quality? So there's a couple things. A really easy one that you can do is to be careful about anything that ends up on the ground. So a lot of our waters end up polluted from runoff and so any way that you are disposing of 
anything like washing your car outside where the soap goes down the storm drain because our storm drains go right into our water sources and we live in the desert our soils do not absorb so anything that is on the surface of our earth ends up in our water um, so being careful about that picking up your dog poop is a huge one that no one ever thinks about with water quality and I live in Reno and every trail I've ever been on has always had a ton of dog poop on it. The next rain that dog poop ends up in our water and that's nutrient load and it's poop. I don't want poop in my water just like you don't want poop in your water. Um, another thing that you can do to improve water quality is to support organizations that do work with water quality. Um, there are some nonprofits here in Reno. I'm sure there are some in Las Vegas that sponsor different types of cleanups and, um, and also voting, making sure that who you are putting into office is someone who supports legislation and regulations that help keep our water systems clean is really important. Um, those are a couple things that you can do to improve water quality. And I don't know, Abby, um, do you have any other practical things for people for improving water quality? Yes, actually. Um, I knew you would. I'll check in. <laughs> there are two things. I'm Googling one more. I thought it was cleanwater.org, but that is not the one I'm thinking of. Um, but there's also the lasvegaswash.org, which is run by um, the Las Vegas Wash Coordination Camp committees and they actually do cleanups along the uh, Pittman wash down here and it's a really beautiful area and so it's um, obviously we'll look at more at the fall for those and um, team up so that's definitely something for down here and then there is especially for our anglers trout unlimited is working with a water Clean water campaign and we are one of the states that has not shown a picture cleaning up garbage in the river um, so like when you're done fishing and you're on your way out if you see any garbage um, throw it in your net take a picture and we're going to upload it to um, this is the Clean Water Act Oh man, I had it on my um, Instagram too. Well, there is another thing that you can do too um, that we did not cover at all, but um, aquatic invasive species are a real issue. Um, so cleaning your waders off, cleaning your boat off when you're transferring between water is really important um, and being mindful of that. We do require that all boats and vessels purchase an AIS sticker. So that is something that you are kind of pledging to be um, to be cognizant cognizant of. And you can buy those stickers on our on our website. Um, that is a great question, though. So it doesn't look like I have any other questions. If you have more questions, please email them to me. Um, and after you leave this webinar, a uh, survey will pop up and it's a very short survey. You can just let me know how we're doing here. Um, make any suggestions. There's a comment box and um, it's been really, really helpful. This is kind of a new thing for us. So we're learning. We're trying to bring content to people that want to see the content. And also this has been recorded and will be up on our YouTube in a couple weeks or so. It's, it's kind of a process to get it up on the YouTube, but um, we do sometimes do our webinars over again too, if it's really popular. Uh, but otherwise you can check out our YouTube. We have a whole YouTube uh, playlist with our recorded webinars and there's all sorts of great stuff on there. And then I also wanna let you know what's coming up with our other webinars. Let me get to my calendar here. So tomorrow at 5 p.m. we have our elusive Nevada animals and that is a series. It's totally different animals every time. It's kind of our more rare Nevada species and what those are like and where you can find those. Um, and that is happening tomorrow at 5 p.m. And then next Tuesday, 
also at 5 p.m. there is a birds and migration webinar that you can hop on. And next Wednesday, the 17th at 5 p.m. with Miss Abby is a reoccurring program on the fish of Southern Nevada. And each week it's a different fish. It's really fun. And on Friday the 19th is another elusive animal. So it'll be different animals on Friday the 19th. And that is also at 5 p.m. So with that, please take that survey. I'm gonna go ahead and end our webinar. Thank you so much for attending.